My name is Jessica Metcalf. I am Turtle Mountain Chippewa from North Dakota, and I am the owner of Beyond Buckskin, which is a website dedicated to promoting and selling Native American-made fashion. There's essentially two parts to Beyond Buckskin. There's the blog side, which the goal is uh, really education. Education through sharing uh, information about contemporary Native American designers, what they're producing today. Also, I do... Uh, historical posts, so posts on uh, ancient adornment practices and kind of revealing hidden histories, I call it. And then the third aspect is critiquing um, the mainstream fashion industry and their use or misuse of Native American names, symbols, iconography, um, and, and our cultures. And then the other aspect of Beyond Buxian, the second part, is the boutique side. So I want to share uh, a little bit of what I, uh, you know, my journey of uh, launching Beyond Buckskin, how it came about, and what I do with this space. In 2009, I was in the mix of writing my doctoral dissertation on native designers of high fashion. And uh, when you're in academia, you quickly realize that your audience for your research and your writing is very small and very limited, and sometimes it's just one person, and that's your professor who is reading your work. And sometimes your professor doesn't even read your work. Now, this really bothered me because I was um, interviewing these designers. They were sharing their experiences with me, and they were also um, sharing their their challenges, their successes. I've also had uh, designers hand over their personal collections of photographs from their past events and brochures. There was this unspoken contract, really, that uh, they were giving me this information and I was going to do something with it. And I was, I was building this archive, but I felt like I wasn't doing enough. So uh, back then, and you know, still to this day, the fastest, cheapest, easiest way to get your words out to a broader audience is through a blog. So in 2009, I launched the blog. So I do a couple things. I do these artist profiles or artist interviews. So it's everything from couture, you know, one-of-a-kind pieces, to the very accessible streetwear designs. What's great about these profiles or interviews is that you get to learn um, from the designers themselves, what they think about their work, what they're inspired by, and what they think about the broader fashion industry. So this is a design by Consuela Pascual. She is Navajo and Mayan, and her ancestors were knowledgeable observers of the sky world. So she takes that ancient inspiration point and combines it with her interest in sci-fi fantasy, fuses it together to create these futuristic, super chic cocktail dresses. But we also have designers like Patricia Michaels, who is Taos Pueblo from New Mexico, and she was actually a finalist on Project Runway. And she says that she begins each garment like a blank canvas. And indeed, she starts most of her garments with a plain white fabric that she paints on and manipulates and turns into these sculptures that we could wear. But then there's also designers like Alano Edzerza, who creates these really bold, awesome streetwear that anybody can access and wear. And then the politically charged streetwear of Jared Yazzie. And of course, I had to show this slide because of the holiday coming up. <laughs> so the really cool work by Jamie Akuma, who is Lisenio and Shoshone Bannock. And what I love about what she does is that she is originally a beadwork artist who is now getting into fashion design. And what's cool is that her beadwork is super modern, contemporary, but it is coming off, off of a tradition of uh, beadwork here. So a couple hundred year old tradition. And then she's putting those beadwork, her own beadwork designs onto fabric that she's turning into uh, beautiful dresses. And so she's making this direct line, right, from contemporary fashion to the traditional adornment practices. And so through these posts, you get to see the diversity, the individuality, 
and creativity that exists in contemporary native fashion design. And then also these designers aren't just popping out of nowhere, but they're actually continuing a legacy. And to really drive that point home, I also write about the traditional stuff, the, the stuff from the 1800s and before. So this is one of my favorite examples. This is a Plains Men's Warrior shirt. And I like it so much because it asks us to think of our warriors as also artists and historians. They went to battle, came back, they would record their feats on their shirts. And these personal stories would go on to become community stories that go on to become history. Now, you can see that there's two sides here. Um, on this side, there are these anthropomorphic figures, and they are to represent how many enemies this shirt wearer took in battle in protecting their community and protecting the rights of their nation. They're drawn with uh, just one leg, and you can see the little foot kicking out, and they're drawn with one leg because this is to represent that this person will no longer walk on this earth, this person is dead. And then on this side, see these lines and these invert inverted triangles, and so this is to represent how many times this shirt wearer uh, carried a pipe in battle. And it might sound weird to carry a pipe in, into battle, but the pipe is how we say, smoke the sacred tobacco, and the tobacco is how we communicate with the sacred world and the creator. So a pipe carrier is in charge of the sacred and spiritual safety of the war party. These individuals were the first to go out into the battlefields, and a lot of times they carried no weapons, just the pipe. And they were the last to retreat to ensure the safety of, of the entire war party. So somebody who has a shirt like this is, is a very important individual, and they show that through these images that they wear. I also talk a lot about the headdress um, because of uh, the mainstream culture's uh, appropriation of this sacred and important item. This item is very important for many, many reasons. One of them is because they're comprised of eagle feathers. Eagle is very important to our culture and cultures. Eagle's like an intermediary between the humans, the people here, and creator. So eagle checks in on us, makes sure that we're doing good, uh, we're doing good things for ourselves and for, for the betterment of our communities, and then kind of reports back to Creator. And if you are doing a good job, you are gifted an eagle feather from Eagle. I have earned uh, two eagle feathers. They're not easy to, do, to earn, but this is a practice that we continue to this day. We still do this. So somebody who has um, this many eagle feathers has achieved a lot for their family, for their community. But what's also interesting is you have somebody like Sitting Bull here. Sitting Bull's headdress is actually comprised of eagle feathers that have been earned by other people. So headdresses can also be a form of voting. If you have two feathers, that person has four, we can bring these, these feathers together to create a headdress that we will gift to somebody that we choose as our leader. When this person wears this headdress, they know that they have our support. We're handing over these important items, these things that we've worked very hard for. But they also feel that weight of their obligation to always work hard for our communities. These are um, value systems that we continue to teach to our children, to our nieces and nephews, in hopes that they continue these practices. So through these types of posts on the blog, you learn about you know, that we have this rich heritage, but also that these are, they're not just objects, they're objects with meaning and story. I also highlight people and how they dress themselves because I like the idea that our ancestors were stylish in the past. I thought, I think that's cool. I would love to just focus on the contemporary stuff and the traditional, you know, really cool examples, but I can't because stuff like this keeps popping up and we need to be talking about it. Over here is uh, Jeremy Scott's collection for Adidas, in which he essentially ripped off a well-known totem pole by a well-respected totem pole carver from the Northwest Coast and gave him no credit at all. On the top right, we have Oprah Winfrey with Ralph Lauren. This is one of her final seasons. Throughout the episode, She's you know, just cooing over Ralph Lauren and calling him the epitome of the American dream. 
Now, this is a problem because Ralph Lauren has built his empire off of selling the native. So when you call him the epitome of the American dream, you are excluding native people from that narrative. Not only that, but you are turning native people and our cultures into commodities that must be sold and consumed by other people in pursuit of the American dream. Now, these are all formal you know, critiques that I have on the blog site. And like I mentioned earlier, it is to provide an alternative perspective, okay? something that you probably never thought of thinking before. And it's to get that perspective out there. And I also do these fun posts. Well, I think they're fun, entertaining. And this one was 20 signs that you're a Native American-inspired hot mess. This is at the time when everybody was wearing feathers all over the place, it was out of control. And this particular person was a guest at Katy Perry's uh, birthday party. It was a Cowboys and Indians theme. And she uh, not only shows up with this full headdress with you know, rodent skulls across her forehead, but she's wearing this white bodysuit with, with feathers. And I'm like, if you have feathers in your crotch, I think you've taken the trend too far. So um, there it is right there. So one of my tips was just say no to crotch feathers. Um, but interestingly, it's these posts that I get the biggest uh, kickback from my readers. Like, people get really mad at me for advising them not to wear crotch feathers. And I'm like, I'm just trying to help you out. <laughs> so in 2011, something very interesting happened. And that was that Urban Outfitters got caught. They had labeled over two dozen of their items as Navajo. These had nothing to do with Navajo people. They were selling the Navajo flask, the Navajo sock, the Navajo panty. Well, the Navajo Nation has actually trademarked their name, and any unauthorized use of the word Navajo is direct violation of trademark law. So the Navajo Nation team of lawyers stepped forward and sent a cease and desist letter. Uh, Urban Outfitters ignored them. There was a group of us that um, caught wind of this. And we took to our own platforms to, to make the broader uh, world know uh, what was going on. We were blogging about it, writing these articles, uh, essentially calling for you know, Urban Outfitters to do something about this, remove the name. They finally removed the name. But we're also talking about, do these businesses have any ethical ob you know, obligations? Do they have it legal? This is, it was illegal for them to do that. So we're talking about this, and throughout the process, I'm saying, hey, instead of buying the native knockoffs, you like the trend, you like the look, why not buy from an actual Native American artist? Now, at that time, in 2011, there wasn't a space for people to easily access native-made fashion. Now, through my work, my research, and through the blog, I had established a really good rapport with these designers. And so we decided to launch the Beyond Buckskin Boutique. We launched it in 2012, and the goals were really basic. It was like to promote this idea of buying native-made, not native knockoffs. And I was encouraging people to think about their purchases as investments. Okay, when you buy something, you're kind of investing in that that company or that brand or that person. So um, do you want to put your money towards a company that's outsourcing and engaging in unethical business practices, or do you want to put your money into an artist who is creative, talented, and actually continuing ancient artistic practices? And it was also to you know, push Native fashion forward and to create a platform. I was seeing all the exciting things going on with Native fashion, but other people weren't, and so I wanted to put it on a plate and show everybody, because it's really cool stuff. We launched with 11 artists, and we've already quadrupled. We have customers, of course, here in the US, but Canada, Sweden, Switzerland, Australia. We've been covered by CNN, ABC, CTV, APTN, El Canada. The media response has been absolutely awesome. So these images are from our first lookbook. I wanted to show you guys this image because this is Martin Sensmeyer, who is a native model and actor, among other things, and he's wearing porcupine quill work medallions. We sell porcupine quill work on the boutique site as earrings or bracelets. And the cool thing about quill work is that it is um, something that is unique 
to native North America. You will not find it anywhere else in the world. And it is an ancient practice that predates contact. It predates the introduction of glass seed beads. And it is still practiced today. When you buy a pair of quill work earrings, you are actively supporting the continuance of these practices, which is really cool. So we just launched the, the boutique. It's exciting. A couple months later, I get a Google alert. You guys know what Google alerts are? Um, so <laughs> anytime there's the words uh, Native American and fashion in an article online, I get an alert. So I got an alert. And uh, what I read piqued my interest. I was like, oh, okay, I got to look into this. So this, it was only two sentences long, the article. And this is what they said. Paul Frank celebrated fashion's night out with a neon Native American powwow theme. Glow-in-the-dark, war-painted employees in feather headbands and bow and arrows invited guests to be photographed on a mini runway holding prop tomahawks. I'm like, wow, two sentences. And they just hit, like, a whole bunch of stereotypes. <laughs> like, that's crazy. I'm like, I got I to gotta see. You know, what? You know, so I was, so I do what every good uh, researcher does, and I googled Paul Frank, you know, fashion night uh, party. I found out that Paul Frank actually has a Facebook page, and so they had just posted over a thousand pictures from this event, and I scrolled through every single one of those pictures, and it was really, really bad. So this is Julius the monkey, who's their main character, and they put Julius in these different environments, like, oh, he's an astronaut. So I guess now he's a, a leader. And to see a monkey in a headdress is... Uh, but it kept, it got worse. So this was my favorite image from that collection of pictures. The employees were, you know, giving these, you know, tomahawks, bow and arrows, feather headbands and stuff to these people, and they would get onto this tiny, you know, stage or runway, and, and they would pose. And the poses that they picked were shocking. She's got the tomahawk up to her throat. Is this what people think Native people are? It was so disheartening. I couldn't believe it. There were children there. Disney stars were there. Evidently, this is our legacy, and it's not a good one. Like I mentioned before, you know, we are trying very hard to educate our youth on our value systems and our practices. And when you see people doing this, what signal does that send to our youth? There was alcohol there. And they gave some creative names to their cocktails, so Neon Teepee, Dream Catcher, Rain Dance Refresher. Yes, we do dances for rain, and it is to keep this world in balance. We work hard for environmental sustainability. And to have an alcoholic beverage named after a sacred ceremonial dance was really disturbing. Myself and my friend and colleague Adrian Keene took to our platforms, okay, the blogs. We each have blogs. And we did the simultaneous blog posting, like within 20 minutes of each other, and uh, wrote critiques of, of this event. I lay it all out. And then at the bottom of my critique, I wrote an open letter to Paul Frank and I call it my list of demands. And this is that letter. To whom it may concern, thank you for removing the powwow pictures from your Facebook page. However, the party still happened, and the images are still out there. We want an apology. Since you are profiting off of a caricature of our cultures, a donation to a Native American youth arts program would be fitting to accompany your apology. Furthermore, if you are genuinely interested in Native American design, I suggest you collaborate with Native American designers in, your, in the future. Your actions are highly offensive, and it is ridiculous to see this level of racism still occurring in 2012. Now, I just threw out the R word, racism. A lot of people will say it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, I don't believe that. And I'll tell you why. Because racism is connected to ideas of power. And in this situation, the participants at this powwow exerted their power over Native people to misrepresent us. Now, we as Native people do not have the luxury nor the right to represent ourselves in mainstream media. 
our cultures and histories are not accurately presented in educational settings, in the business world, nor in the legal world. When we attempt to regain any control over how our identities and cultures are being misused, we are met with extreme opposition. We are told time and again to get over it. But what is ignored is the fact that rights to misrepresent someone else's culture, and in this case, directly aids in the destruction of indigenous cultural practices and communities. Like I mentioned before with the headdress, when you have people turning it into something trivial while we're fighting so hard to keep those practices, those value systems intact, it's really disheartening and uh, frustrating. Then something really weird happened. I got an email from the president of Paul Frank. And I said, oh, shit. He read it. <clears throat> oh, no. I, I had no idea. I saw it in my inbox, and I actually was like, I can't read it. I'm not going to read it. It sat there for a couple hours, and then I was like, I got to see what it is. Popped it open, and he apologized. And he asked to get on the phone and talk about this, how they can move forward in a positive direction, what they can do. And I was blown away. What do you do when somebody actually listens to you? Ah! <laughs> it was like, oh my gosh. So uh, we got on the phone with him, and the, the things that we asked for, they did. They removed all of their, um, the pictures, the images. They apologized, did a formal apology. Uh, they made a donation, uh, and they collaborated with Native designers. We worked on this for a year. The soup hit the fan in September, and the following August, we launched the Paul Frank Native Designers capsule collection. So in 11 months, we, we busted our butts to make this happen. And the people at Paul Frank were working overtime. Uh, we were all working overtime to make this happen because we believed so much in, in it. We wanted to have a good example. We wanted to give a good case study, like this could happen. So the designers are uh, Louis Gong, Dustin Martin, Candice Halcrow, and Autumn Don Gomez. And it was just an extraordinary experience just kind of some conclusions, if you can call them conclusions. Unfortunately, the bad examples still outnumber the good. So, you know, we do have um, examples of, you know, awesome stuff being done by actual Native American designers, and we have really cool collaborations. Recently, Valentino collaborated with uh, a Métis artist from Canada who is Christy Belcourt. Just beautiful work. Um, and that's what we want to see more of. But those are rare. There's still a lot of designers who are producing these kind of knockoff uh, collections. The thing is, is that the fashion industry is one of the hardest industries to break into regardless of your background. It doesn't matter who you are. You have to have a lot of money. You have to have a lot of connections. We don't have that. So we band together. We work together. And the idea is that when we work together, we can share costs, but also we can cause a bigger ruckus and people will Maybe you'll be like, oh, there's something actually going on here. I really want to put forward this idea. It's so hard to get into the fashion industry. So maybe if we do collaborations with a major company or an international fashion designer, it would get us a seat at the table. And then really, you know, the power of cross-cultural collaborations is, is really important because then we can look at each other as individuals, not as a stereotype or a misunderstanding of somebody's culture, but we can understand them as a person, and it gets down to uh, respect and honor. I see Beyond Buckskin as, as a vital bridge. So I'm, I want to connect people. I want to connect the consumers of Native fashion with the, with the creators of Native fashion. I want to connect the designers who are interested in producing Native-inspired collections with the Native designers who are producing authentic representations. And maybe we can bring some of that genuine creativity to, to the fashion industry and see a different way of how the fashion industry works with being more ethical and in being more inclusive. So let's keep in touch, let's connect. I think that's the most vital thing is connecting with people, bridge building, and having those conversations. So thank you guys so much for your attention. <laughs>